As uh, Noel said, originally this was going to be, there were going to be two talks on Digilight, one theory and one in practice, but having the table outside, this is going to be the, the mainly theoretical one. Until Noel mentioned yesterday that this would also include uh, forthcoming developments, so last night I hurriedly put a few more slides into it. Digilight isn't a new system, it's been around for a number of years in various forms, um, generally known as the poor man's DATV because it involves a computer in there somewhere. And it's been worked on by uh, many French stations, M0 DTS in the UK, and it's sort of evolved and branched off and gone in various forms. So I just tried to take uh, the best bits from all of it, improve them, make it a bit more compact and a bit quicker. Generally, it's been run on uh, Linux before, but I haven't uh, used that for a long time. I think it was about 20 years ago when it was Xenix. So I didn't really want to, uh, to learn it all again, so I thought I'd try and do it on Windows. So let's uh, quickly look at... Uh, I'll do the developments first in case I run out of time at the end. The SD card add-on board you've probably seen by now. It's appeared in the, in the magazine. And that allows you to transmit uh, pre-recorded files as a generator program that takes the, the files that GBPVR records. And you can have several of those on the, the SD card. Um, you don't need the PC connected when you're running these, so handy for a quick test card, shack tour, uh, even portable testing, running out to a mounting quickly, just the test paths. Um, possibly even BATC contests, you just film your number and your call sign and go out without any cameras or computers. I'm not sure if that's actually legal or in the spirit of it, but uh, certainly possible. Uh, the two gig, two gigs the maximum card size you can have at the moment. Uh, 40 minutes of video at SR4000 or about one of G4 KLB's overs. And um, just a simple PCB and uh, you've probably seen that out on the, on the table. Um, you can actually do it out of PCB and just wire it. There's only about two capacitors, uh, two resistors and a capacitor on it. So that's here now. Other bits and pieces. The, the Nyquist filter, that's the five pole LC filter. Um, the square waves come out of the, the pick. You don't want to be transmitting square waves. So um, it should roll it off in uh, a factor of 0.35, so it comes down very quickly. but it's uh, not really optimum. So the way to do it, or the best way to do it, like uh, DATV Express, is to do it in a, an FPGA. But um, that means you probably won't be very homebrew. Loads of pins, very small. So I wanted to keep it uh, homebrew if possible. And I think I can do it. It would probably be the same size chip as the, um, the one on the back of the board, the, uh, the latch chip, the SOIC 1.27 millimetres. I try not to go any smaller than that these days. Um, hopefully this one will work with several symbol rates and you won't have to be swapping every time you want to change. Um, and hopefully uh, the range will include the, the lower symbol rates that we've heard of that uh, we might be using for H.264 and on 70 sems and, uh, and other bands. Another development, it's actually, uh, there's been a couple of uh, test programs in the, f in the field for a while. Um, F60ZP has been using it for a while and, um, with his, uh, his the Tutu and other software. This had the advantage that um, at the moment you're restricted to reading from disk, so there's not really much else you can do. But um, with UDP, it's a network protocol, so in theory you can accept data from anywhere um, you can get rid of the um, write into disk by actually networking inside your own computer. It doesn't actually go anywhere, but uh, that, then it becomes diskless. Um, you can do it from different PCs on your network. So you're really separating the, the video capture from the, uh, the actual transmission. Um, so in theory, anywhere on the internet, you could be sending data as UDP that you've captured and uh, transmitting from somewhere else. 
You can have split repeaters or outside broadcasts or all sorts of possibilities. I've given it a brief try. I had my 3G dongle running one mega symbol um, and receiving it back on the, the Sky broadband and uh, that worked very well. How it works in practice with high data rates which, uh, we'll have to see. So it will take the program stream which we'll go into shortly, that's what comes from the PVR150. Transport stream, which is the format that's actually transmitted. A lot of things produce transport stream or raw data. And with raw data, effectively, it's a, it's a QPSK modulator um, with an Ethernet connection that's accessible from anywhere. So that has possibilities. It needn't be, key, uh, needn't be um, DVBS. It could be high-speed data, anything you like, really. So those are the things that will be uh, are here and will be uh, coming up. Not quite sure when. But we'll see how it goes. Um, mainly this one here. I want to. Um, I've been working on the, the lower speeds, which um, seem to cause more problems than the higher speeds. If you haven't got much data to play with, you have to make sure the buffer doesn't empty and you uh, you lose sync. So that's working fine at um, 1,000 to 4,000, like the main program at the moment. Right, a quick um, run through of the uh, Digilite system. Video and audio comes in the normal way, on phonos usually, into the, the PVR 150 card. GB PVR records it to disk. The Digilite transmits, reads it off the disk. The shaded area is the, uh, the external Digilite board. The high speed USB interface running at um, in theory, 480 megabits per second, so there won't be any bottlenecks there for the 8 megabit we need. Parallel serial converter, the not too great Nyquist filtering, and into the, the modulator and the amplifier. Let's have a look at some of the, uh, what all these different types of streams mean and what the data format is. And It's an MPEG DVBS, the Data formats are rather like an onion, layers within layers. You take some data, you wrap a bit more data around it, and call it something else. So the, the format coming out of the uh, PVR 150 is called program stream. It's in 2K blocks. And several blocks will make up a frame of uh, a video. In the 50 hertz system, we have uh, um, a frame every 40 milliseconds, the, the two interlaced fields. So within the program stream, there are two packetized elementary streams. And within those, there are elementary streams. And this is where the actual MPEG data is. A few of the important, uh, there's timestamps and timers all over the place in MPEG and DVB. Some of the more important ones, the system clock reference is a timer running through the, the program stream. Um, that's not a real-time timer as such, it's more an indicative one. It's saying to the device that actually is showing the data, when your time gets to this, do other things. Presentation timestamp. Each frame of data has this in, and it tells the receiver when to actually present that to the TV to display it. And that will go up in 40, second, 40 millisecond uh, increments. The decode timestamp, because of the way MPEG works, you don't actually transmit the, the frames in the order they're displayed, because some frames refer to bits of data from past frames and future frames, which is a bit hard to refer to something in the future, so you have to transmit some things out of order. So this is telling the, you may have both, some frames will have both of these in. It will be saying, display this frame then, but decode it a bit earlier because something else might want to use it. So let's have a look at um, some sample frames. Each one of these boxes is a, a frame of data consisting of several 2K blocks from our program stream. So you can see the system clock reference is stepping on 40 milliseconds for each frame. Um, I don't know if it's standard, but the way it comes out of the PVR 150, the, the presentation time, that's the time that the you actually display the frame is, is 40 milliseconds in the future, so it gives time for things to happen. 
So here we are, one frame, another frame, pre pre present this at 440, present this frame at 480. Here we have one of these out of sequence frames. We're not actually displaying this on the TV until time 640, but it's saying decode it at time 520 because these frames are likely to be using it. And then we go back to the, the normal type of frame, show this frame at 560, show this frame at 600. These numbers can get quite enormous, of course. It's a 42-bit counter, but uh, they're small just for uh, the demonstration. You notice there's no frame being presented there at 520 milliseconds. Where's that gone? So we go from show a frame at 440, 480. This one's saying show it at 640, 560, and 600. So the 520 is missing. That's because there'll be another frame like this somewhere up here. Oops. Another frame like this somewhere back here, which will have been de decoded back here, and it will have a presentation time of our missing 520. So that's where the apparently missing frame comes from. Another one of these out of order frames with a different decode time and a presentation time. That's the, that was the, the program stream. That's the format that comes from the PVR 150. But the, our transmission format for DVBS is transport stream. 188 byte packets. We use it very simply in, uh, in DigiLite. We usually have just one within the transport stream. We have one stream for video, one stream for audio. But in practice, it's uh, press the wrong button. In practice, the, you can have several channels within the same transport stream modulated onto the same carrier. I think Sky generally have seven or eight uh, programs on the, on the one carrier transport stream. So we, we've taken our packetized elementary streams, the second layer of that previous onion, and we're splitting them up now into these 188 byte packets. This is the, uh, the format of it. Of it. Sync bytes start to 47H, hexadecimal. PIDs we'll look at shortly can be uh, that value. Then the, the rest of the uh, these uh, four first bytes of control, the rest is uh, continuity counter, just goes around from 0 to 15 for each particular PID. And there's some other bits and pieces in there, the main data, 184 bytes. Start talking about PIDs, so let's have a closer look at those. Packet identifier. Because we, uh, we're using it very simply in DigiLite, say on the Sky Transponder, you could have BBC, seven, eight channels on a transponder, all on the same transport stream. Um, they'll have video, could have several audio streams within the teletext, subtitles, all sorts. So there could be 40 or so different streams within the, the transport stream. The receiver has to know when you say BBC One, it has to know what bits of the transport stream to extract to, to show the program you want. So that's where PIDs come in. Every one of these, this, this, these streams is assigned uh, a PID. So we'll see how you, the receiver knows which PIDs to use. But it's, if you're looking for PID 256 on uh, DigiLite's the standard, 256 for the, the video, 257 for the audio. Then when you tune onto your DigiLite channel, the receiver will say, oh, 256, and it will start pulling out 256 and 257 and assembling them back into the, uh, into the, the packetized elementary streams that it started out as. Some, some PIDs are reserved, we'll see why shortly. Because there are so many PIDs in the transport stream, the receiver needs to know which refers to what, which channels um, have which PIDs, and this is done with the, uh, a directory called the Program Specific Information. And this data is also um, in a stream which has its own PID. So, lots of tables, these uh, extra entries, the, the index effectively. Top table is the program association table. Every channel in the transport stream has an entry here, and that is just a PID where you can find the, the program map table. 
for that particular channel, BBC One, Lava Programme, Map Table, BBC Two, etc. Programme Map Table itself contains the list of PIDs for each component of the channel. So this will tell, will tell you where BBC One Video is, which PID, where BBC One Audio is, BBC One Teletext, and so on. Network information table, not used very much in Digilite, but on Sky, say, it would, it would have the uh, list of all the other transponders on the network or on the, uh, on the satellite. When you do a network search on your receiver, this is what it will be using. It will find, start somewhere, find one, and if you said do a network search, it will find from this where all the other transponders are and go off and search those as well. Here's one of our reserved, this is always, well, the, the NIT doesn't need to be on 16, but generally it is by default. Um, the next one, the service descriptor table, always on PID 17. And this just has a list of the channel names. So in here you'll see BBC One, BBC Two, etc. The event information table, this is where in DigiLight config you fill in those boxes saying channel name, program name, EPG info, and this is where, the, where it is in the, the transport stream, always on PID 18. Again, DigiLight just has the, the currently running program on there, but in practice, um, you'd have lots of information here. This is how the EPG gets built up. And bring up the rear is the, the time of day table, always on PID 20, so the receiver knows what time it is relative to the uh, he knows when to show that this data relative to the current time. Here's a typical PID structure for a, um, a transport stream which just has two, two channels in it. We have our program association table on PID 0. When you scan it for the first time, that's, this is what the receiver will look for, the, the, the program association table. Uh, yeah. This can have an entry into the network information table if it's not defaulting. Then this is telling us for our first channel, look, on, look for the program map table on PID 100. So then it will go off and look for PID 100, which is the program map table for channel 1. Then we have a list here of all the PIDs for all the services on the channel. So it will store that away. It will store the frequency. It will store that away. Service descriptor table, just a, a name. That's the first entry in your Digilite config. And the, uh, always on PID 17. And um, the event information table, name of the program, something about the program, and when it actually runs. For the second channel, this is saying look for the program map table on PID 200. So it goes off to look for PID 200 finds the program map table for channel 2, and here we have a list of uh, all the, the PIDs for all the components of the, the second channel. Um, audio description, there could be several audio channels on, on, some tra on some channels, different languages and so on. So when you're scanning, it will look for the PAT, that will tell it where the PMTs are, it gives you the name of the channel, and it will then store away frequency, all these PIDs, and this name. So when you select BBC One, it will go up to this information and start picking out PID 110, PID 120, and so on, and start building the, the packetized elementary screens back together so we can actually display them. Timing in the, the transport stream, very important. You've probably seen in reference to the, uh, the PCR, the program clock reference. This is a 42-bit timer based on a 27-meg oscillator. Uh, it's, uh, it's split into two parts, 33 bits and 9 bits, which is very programmer friendly. And it's embedded into, this is a real time timer. When you actually transmit the PCR, that is the time as far as the system is concerned. You can, put, oops, you can uh, put it on the video PID, 
um, but it can be on a separate PID of its own. It doesn't really matter. It saves a bit of data if it's on the, uh, the same PID as the video. And the main uh, point of the PCI is to synchronize the 27 meg oscillator and the PVR 150, which is generating the video, and the 27 meg oscillator and receiver, which is actually displaying the video. You don't want those, those to drift out or you start having problems with synchronization. So in the receiver, I imagine there's a 42-bit counter attached to this 27 meg oscillator. Um, and so every time the PCR comes in, it will compare its counter with the PCR, and if they're different, it will presumably slew the oscillator slightly one way or the other to keep them in, in sync. Effectively, it's a sort of phase lock loop as such. Um, we saw in the program stream the system clock reference. That doesn't get carried forward. Now we use the, um, the PCR and all the timestamps we saw in the data. They now refer to the, the PCR. You can't have any gaps in the DVBS transmission. It's got to be synchronous. Even if you have nothing to transmit, you have to transmit a packet of nothing. But you have to transmit something. So the PCR is... Uh, the difference between two PCRs is the number of bits between the two PCRs times that multiplied by the time to transmit each bit. And the, the way we initialize it, you've probably seen this parameter in uh, Digilai config that you never touch. Uh, that just seemed like a good value at the time. It seems to work. So say in our first PVR 150 video frame, the SCR was 3000, Digilai config TS delay parameter 200, we initialize the PCR to do 2800. So when this first frame of data gets to the receiver, it will be saying the time now is 2800. And by the way, this frame of video should be displayed at 3000. So you've got 200 milliseconds to do it. If every frame of data took 40 milliseconds to transmit, then every frame of data would get to the receiver 200 milliseconds ahead of time. But the way the MPEG compression works, you generally have, um, you send a whole frame, then lots of little increments, then you start again over a second or so. So the, the first frame, this whole frame, may actually take more than 40 milliseconds to transmit. So say it takes 80 milliseconds, then the, the next frame is going to get there at uh, um, 160 milliseconds before it's due. So it's to give you a bit of leeway. As the the data rate, its data rate is consistent over a second or so, but certainly not over a few hundred, which is what we're trying to achieve and keep the, the latency, the video delay, down to a minimum. So the, the time the, the data gets there is varying like that. Um, you don't want it to get there too late or else it's, you'll get glitches. It'll get there after its display time. Conversely, you can't get it, let it get there too soon because there's only a certain amount of buffering in the receiver. So when it actually comes to its display time, it may well have fallen off the edge and been replaced by something else. So it's a bit of a balancing act to try and keep the latency low, the video delay low, but then make sure the data gets there within this range all the time. Right, now we've... Uh, we converted our video packets from packetized elementary stream to transport stream. Uh, we've done the same to the audio packets. We've got all our PSI information. Now we want to um, multiplex them all together and produce the, uh, the transport stream for further processing. Uh, PCR usually gets put in every 40 milliseconds. That's the, the DVB spec. Um, they go in every 500 milliseconds all the program information. And the bit rate you put in GBPVR, it's set to give you 95% of the wanted data, and that leaves 5% which you pad out, and it's during this elastic process where you're trying to balance the, make sure everything stays in the window of arrival. Um, padding will be going in there to stop the buffer emptying, and uh, just keep everything within the window. So once we've done that, we have our, uh, that's on packet 8191, another reserve packet, a packet of nothing effectively. The receiver just ignores it, but it must have something so that it doesn't lose sync. Looking at Digilite Transmit in more detail, 
Uh, we've actually we've done the first four steps. We've taken the packetized elementary streams, we've split them up, we've created all these extra bits and pieces, all the indexing, and we've uh, multiplexed them together. At this point, you can still read the transport stream with Windows Media Player. I think that just throws away most of the wrapping and just uh, builds up the packetized elementary streams again. But uh, this wouldn't be very uh, r robust for transmission. In theory, you only need one bit in error, and your snooker table changes from green to pink. So you need to make it a bit more robust on the, the transmission. So there's a few stages of error correction and error avoidance. Um, first two are really linked. We invert the sync byte on every eighth packet from 47 to B8. Then there's an energy dispersal randomization section. In data transmission, you tend to pad out unused um, parts of data with all ones or all zeros, which is very bad for modulate demodulators. Demodulators like to see data changing all the time. It's like riding a bike, really. It's easier to stay on it if you're moving rather than standing still. So we take eight packets, invert the sync byte on the first one, and then exclusive all, all those with a, a pseudo-random table and create eight new output packets. That way, you're going to be anything that's 0, 0, 0, 0, or all ones is going to be scrambled up into something a bit more variable. Uh, the first byte has never changed. That's the sync byte. The receiver will need that later on to know that it's actually um, it's got to sync back with the, uh, with the incoming data. Also, if you get any of these long runs of noughts and ones, it tends to cause a spike in the energy in the... Uh, in the, uh, the modulation. We want to keep our modulation very, very smooth across the window. You're seeing with the, the test modes, effectively, they cause sideband spikes at various points. You can see how you can do it if you have uh, repetitive data. The next stage is uh, Reed Solomon, which you heard about in uh, F60ZP's talk yesterday. This is a forward error correction method. Um, So you take your 188 byte packet, run it through the Reed Solomon error corrector, and you add 16 bytes, so you now have a 204 byte packet. The forward error correction means forward means it, it goes with the original data. You're not asking for retries. Forward means the data is the error correction data is transmitted. So we now have a uh, a packet of uh, 204 bytes. I don't know how this works, how the decoding works. It's very clever stuff. Um, any 8 bytes in error anywhere in those 204 now, even if it's one bit or all bits or any bits, you can detect and correct it. And you can actually get a bonus. If, if the demodulator knows there was a bit of a splat somewhere, then uh, you actually get, uh, get a few extra. You can correct uh, more than that. Reed Solomon's been around for a long time. It's been used on the Voyager spacecraft. Um, it's used on DVDs and CDs. And it's a very clever mechanism. Based on Galois field arithmetic, apparently, invented by the Frenchman Evariste Galois, I think. Um, unfortunately, he was killed in a duel at the age of 20. It's thought to be a great loss to mathematics. So that's our first stage of uh, error correction. Now we have interleaving. This is more error avoidance rather than error correction. If you look at the example here, say we're transmitting those, uh, because of we saw in the, the read Solomon, it can correct any eight bytes in error in the, the packet. Well, if a burst of noise takes out nine bytes, then you're stuck, you've lost one. So what we want to do is try and make noise bursts spread the errors out over and not make them uh, continuous. So with this example here, say you're transmitting letters A to T. You actually transmit every fifth one. If you get a, a zap in the middle, when you actually de-scramble it, de-interleave it, the errors are now moving out, spreading out. Obviously, you want to do it over more than five. And you actually do it over 
take each packet and spread it out over the next 12 packets. So that's what, 2400 bytes, so any, any error burst in here taking out a lot of bytes, they'll get distributed back all over these 12 packets when you actually, the receiver actually comes to do the, uh, the demodulation and decoding stage. And here comes our second uh, forward error correction. Uh, this is the one we know as FEC. This is the, the, the parameter we put in, and it's known as Viterbi, invented by an American, Mr. Viterbi. I always wondered why that was. But, uh, in the 70s, I think it was invented. This is yet another clever, again, I don't know how it works, the decoding, but it's another clever error correction method. Everything's based on the uh, FEC of 1, 2. It is as it looks a fraction. 1, 2 means you put one bit in, you get two bits out. Um, FEC 3, 4, you put three bits in, you get four bits out. So it's expanding the amount of data in the transmission. So the, the higher the FEC fraction, um, the more error correction you get, but the less space there is for your original data. So it's error correction at the expense of um, maybe picture quality. So everything starts off with FEC 1, 2. So you put 8 bits in, and we get these two lots of 8 bits coming out. So 8 bits in, 16 bits out. And if you've set your transmission to FEC 1, 2, then this is what will be transmitted. They'll all go out on the I, on the I uh, connection. They'll all go out on the Q connection. If you want to uh, use the other FECs, then we start with the, the FEC12. So we say our one, one, we put three bits in, 110, one, and we get our two lots of three bits coming out. What you do then is we only want um, four coming out, and we've got six, so you drop two of them. It's known as puncturing for some reason. So you drop that one, you drop that one, and those are the four bits which are actually transmitted. Similarly for seven, eight, you put seven bits in, you get two lots of seven bits out of the Viterbi 1-2 processor. Uh, we only want eight, so we have to drop six of them. So we drop those three and those three. This pattern's always the same. You take, you have your six bits, you always drop that one and that one. The next six bits, you always drop the same bits in the same place. Similarly here. Every seven pairs that come out, you always drop those bits in that particular place and start again. You'll notice now that we don't actually have our original data anymore, so spur a thought for what the poor receiver has to do now. It can't see any sync bytes, it's just got these, just string, a string of bits coming out. Um, most receivers seem to be able to detect which FEC you're using. Um, they seem to cope with INQ reversed, inverted, uh, nothing seems to fool them. So what it must do is it must uh, start with one FEC and try and work backwards from this process, see if that works. If that didn't work, it tries, tries three, four, and so on throughout all the FECs. Um, and it must have to do that. It starts at a bit, see if anything makes sense, move on to the next bit, see if anything makes sense. Um, and of course, if, if you've got uh, corruption here, then it's got to take that into account as well. It's got to be able to detect that and correct it. So, uh, clever stuff. I uh, don't know how it does it, but uh, once it starts seeing those sync bytes again, it will see the, the four sevens coming out. If it sees those every 204 bytes and a B8 every eighth one of those, then then it, that's really the hard work over. It's got, it knows it's got back in sync then. Then it goes back through the, uh, once it's done that, it will, uh, once it's done this backward step, it will go through the interleaving process. That's fixed. It knows what's happening there. It rebuilds each packet from the, the 12. Um, hopefully that will have uh, spread any consecutive errors caused by noise bursts then 
It looks at the read Solomon. It can correct any eight errors in the 204 byte packets. Once it's done that, it, it drops the, the last 16, so you're back to 188 byte packets. And then again, this is a, a, a thing. It knows how this was done. Once it can see the B84747 at the start of each packet, then uh, it can do the reverse of this. And that's easy. So that's uh, what the receiver has to do. Um, how are we doing for time? Serializer, very simple thing really. It uh, just takes in parallel bytes, um, splits them into I and Q. You can transmit two bits at a time on QPSK, so these I and Q, that's a symbol, that's two bits, so your data rate's always twice your symbol rate in QPSK, and it sends those out to, to I and Q. So, uh, fairly simple device, really. And the, the PIC's a very nice chip. It's got some nice facilities. This gobbledygook here means it's, uh, you don't have to do much work. It doesn't take much processor overhead to actually output the data, leaving the chip to actually do all the processing. That's about it. Uh, three minutes for questions. Before then, I'd like to thank the BATC for sponsoring the project, without whom it would probably be... Uh, just on a, an obscure web page somewhere, and all the people who've uh, helped test and develop and publicize it. It's been a, a team effort, a project that's uh, come from a team anyway over many years, so uh, real amateur project. So uh, that's about it. Any questions, please? <laughs>